In her ethics, Ayn Rand identified rationality as the central moral virtue. She also named six others as essential to being rational. She did not claim to give an exhaustive inventory of the virtues, though. And one finds that courage, for instance, long and widely considered a virtue, does qualify in Ayn Rand's book, though as a particular exercise of integrity rather than as a separate major virtue in its own right. It's natural to wonder about how other conventionally praised virtues fare on the objectivist ethics, particularly those on which Ayn Rand herself said very little. This morning, I'll discuss kindness, generosity, and charity. I will often refer to these as KGC. I'm sorry. I know that's kind of ungainly, but uh, it also sounds a little like the KGB. If you write it in capitals, it looks like KFC, so it's got some odd connotations. <laughs> but just too many syllables, too few minutes. So, okay. Why this trio, KGC? Well, I'm writing a book on Ayn Rand's theory of how to be a rational egoist, the kinds of principles that that calls for. The bulk of the book is devoted to the major virtues that Ayn Rand identifies. I thought it would also be useful to try to ascertain the status of certain virtues that Ayn Rand does not name, however. And because a common knock on the egoist is that he's too self-absorbed, I chose to consider some purported virtues that involve our relations with other people. There are also a few other of these virtues, or would-be virtues, that I talk about in the book, though all very briefly. The average person is often stupefied at the idea that an egoist might even entertain the possibility of being KGC. How can an egoist be kind? Isn't it against your policy to be nice to other people? <laughs> Maybe you can be nice when you want something. You might be all for using people, buttering them up in order to get specific ends out of them. But to be truly kind or generous or charitable, would be a flagrant breach of egoistic principles, they think. A policy of me first cannot abide being so considerate or giving to other people. Now, anyone who understands objectivism can see through this pretty quickly. Enemies of objectivism assume a zero-sum scenario in which more or better for me necessarily entails less or worse for you such that the pursuit of one's own well-being must involve the obstruction of others. If my self-interest requires a diminishment of others, then KGC are out of the question. For any KGC extended to help another person must be drawn from the agent's own interest. It must be a sacrifice, which is precisely what Ayn Rand opposes. Objectivists realize that the zero-sum premise is erroneous. Now, I'm not here going to go into that or why that is. That's been covered in a lot of other objectivist uh, writings and lectures over the years. Yet that zero-sum mindset is the mindset that we confront and why I think it's useful to engage this issue. Most of us, including most of us in this room, most objectivists, most of us were raised by altruists, and that creed is certainly reinforced at every turn it's all but inevitable that we will absorb certain altruistic ideas, often subconsciously. As a result, it's easy for an objectivist to let ideas of KGC rattle around in our minds. I'm sorry, well, make it plural or singular, but not both. It's easy for objectivists to let uh, KG, ideas of KGC rattle around in our minds, not quite sure of their exact propriety. Dimly aware that we do not esteem them as altruists do, but also sensing that they have something going for them. This lecture is meant to untangle such murky thoughts that many of us may have never fully worked through to resolution. Now, I want to make clear at the outset that KGC are a comparatively minor issue. In saying that, I risk deflating my subject at the same time that I need to be motivating you, right? Telling you this is really important. And it is important, but I do, you know, it's important that I not be understood, uh, not be misunderstood on this. By focusing on KGC for an entire session this morning, I do not mean to exaggerate their importance. I'm not saying, you know, these are really crucial, and Ayn Rand should have spent more time on them, or granted them a bigger role in her philosophy. I don't think it's a mistake that she did not say much about these. 
I in no way mean to be elevating them to the level of significance of the major virtues or major vices. Yet it is worth examining them because they are inflated to disproportionate significance in the culture we live in. And that creates hazards, twin dangers, really. The ideals of KGC appeal to objectivists' benevolence. A spirit of success and happiness permeates Ayn Rand's heroes and philosophy. It is a sunlit world, a benevolent universe. Because we reject the idea that the quest for values is a zero-sum game, realizing that others' success is no threat to our own, we can feel benevolently disposed toward our fellow men. Given that disposition, it's easy to assume that KGC are right, appropriate, and fall into line with the dominant celebration of these. The danger, though, is that conventional moralists preach KGC as duties. It is your unconditional obligation to be kind, generous, or charitable, regardless of whether you do, in fact, value the recipients. The dominant morality calls for indiscriminate KGC, or something very close to that. Certainly, the value of another person to you should not be the basis of your actions. That would be selfish. Thus, an objectivist could easily find himself sometimes acting out of this version of KGC on false premises about when or why they're appropriate. On the other side, because of the treacly, altruistic way in which these things are usually spouted, it's understandable to have the reaction, I want nothing to do with them. Pitches like compassionate conservatism probably turn your stomach. Right? I mean, right? So it's natural to want to turn away from compassion and allied notions altogether. Yet that would be a mistake. KGC can enhance our lives. It's helpful to understand the propriety of KGC so that we can navigate between renouncing the, uh, renouncing the value they offer and accepting the self-sacrificial baggage that customarily destroys their value and converts them into threats to values. If you like, in the q and I can give you another example of the use of compassion in philosophy that I recently came across that was kind of revolting. By the way, am I, am I going too quickly? I don't think so, but okay, good. All right, a word on the agenda. Our outline is very simple. It's on your handout. I hope everybody got a two-sided handout, okay? Uh, I've given you, I didn't really break the outline much very much. It's at the top of your handout. A few other items on there. Well, I, actually, before I mention the other items, let me just say, um, I start with charity because Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff have written and said very little on these three, but Ayn Rand, said, Ayn Rand said the most on charity. So we'll start with that one, because seeing what she said there, I think, can give us some guidance for the others as well. Okay. Then, also on the handout, I've given you a few definitions, a few quotations, as well as a few items of clarification that I won't actually include in the lecture, but I will point to these things when they're relevant so that you don't need to be fishing around wondering when should I be looking at these. Okay. One other preliminary, this is literally work in progress. Uh, I was revising this very chapter of the book, uh, and I was early in revising it when I had to stop to prepare this lecture. And as soon as I get back to Austin, I will be continuing work on this chapter. So it, take it as work in progress, and it makes me particularly interested in your thoughts and questions during the, the question period. OK, then let's begin with charity. Broadly, charity means love the Christian ideal of brotherly love. More specifically, charity refers to almsgiving, giving aid to people in need. A contemporary ethicist characterizes charity as, quote, the disposition to be moved by and respond to distress, close quote. Veneration of charity is longstanding and all but universal. The Greeks were a notable exception to this. Who is most widely touted as the epitome of virtue in recent decades? Mother Teresa, precisely because of her charitable labors. The propriety of charity is so widely taken for granted that it seems churlish to question it. Charity toward others is part of what being moral means in many people's minds. Its status as a virtue is self-evident. Correspondingly, one encounters few arguments for charity. 
and those that are occasionally offered are pretty feeble. Perhaps in recognition of this, in recent decades, calls for charity have gravitated into the territory of justice. Appeals increasingly contend that charitable deeds are necessary to fulfill the demands of justice. Now, this is not an entirely novel development. Some important voices from the past also linked the two. Yet the shift in the language in which we discuss charity, I think, testifies to the sharp inroads this perspective has made in recent years. We rarely speak of a charity case anymore because it's deemed, or it, yeah, it's deemed demeaning to refer so baldly to a person's need as the basis for giving to him. We speak instead of giving something back, which, as objectivists pointed out several years ago, suggests that a person took something and justice demands repaying it. Doing your fair share, we hear that a lot, right? That similarly implies that justice governs helping others. People are encouraged to give youth a second chance by buying magazine subscriptions or raffle tickets they don't particularly want on the grounds that everyone deserves a second chance and failing to offer one would be an injustice. Even the dominant mode of referring to the poor as the less fortunate implies that a person's prosperity is a matter of chance, and it would be unfair of those who are more fortunate to be possessive about what mere fortune has happened to bestow on them. Doing so would unjustly punish a person for bad luck. Now the chief question for us is whether charity is compatible with rational egoism. And the answer to that is straightforward. A rational egoist's own happiness is properly his highest end. Since values are the means and the substance of a person's happiness, to surrender one's values to others solely on the basis of their need would be to abandon that end. Another person's well-being is not more important than one's own. Bill's well-being may be more important to him than it is to Tom. There's no reason why Tom should treat it as more important to Tom. The idea that another person's need in and of itself constitutes a morally compelling claim on a person's resources clearly reflects altruism. Dedicating, dedication to achieving one's own well-being, however, affords no basis for such an obligation to serve others. That said, egoism is not opposed to goodwill or to acting on goodwill. Helping others in need need not be a betrayal of self-interest. It is not a positive virtue, however. It is not an activity that a person should adopt as his regular standing policy. Giving to every panhandler, or every tenth panhandler, or to every innocent victim of a natural disaster would drain a person's resources and weaken his ability to achieve his happiness. Ayn Rand addressed this issue in an interview, and this is passage A on your handout. Uh, I guess that's on side two. Yeah, passage A under the quotations. Quote, my views on charity are very simple. I do not consider it a major virtue, and above all, I do not consider it a moral duty. There is nothing wrong in helping other people if and when they are worthy of the help, and you can afford to help them. I regard charity as a marginal issue. What I am fighting is the idea that charity is a moral duty and a primary virtue." Close quote. In referring to charity as a marginal issue, Ayn Rand is not denying the reality of poverty or suffering. Her point is that helping others is not what a person's life or morality is about. Under altruism, charity is central, since some individuals' needs create other individuals' duties, and morality revolves around serving others. Wrenching as others' suffering can be, though, emotions do not dictate virtue and vice. Rational self-interest is the proper measure for our actions. And by this standard, charity is not a virtue. Treating one's own happiness as one's highest moral purpose does not entail indifference toward others, as egoism's opponents are eager to charge. It does entail that a person not subordinate any part of his own happiness to theirs. As Ayn Rand indicates in the passage just read, 
Assisting a person in need can be consistent with egoism under appropriate circumstances. If one person cares about another in distress, as lover, friend, or fellow human being, it can be in his interest to help. A person can care about others without caring about all equally and without caring about another as much as about himself. Nonetheless, genuine concern is manifested in action. As Ayn Rand writes, and this one is not on your handout, quote, the practical implementation of friendship, affection, and love consists of incorporating the welfare, the rational welfare of the person involved into one's own hierarchy of values, then acting accordingly, close quote. Even to aid strangers, then, can sometimes make self-interested sense if one recognizes strangers' potential value or simply values them as fellow human beings. Ayn Rand is explicit about the rational approach, and this is passage B on your handout. Quote, the proper method of judging when or whether one should help another person is by reference to one's own rational self-interest and one's own hierarchy of values. The time, money, or effort one gives, or the risk one takes, should be proportionate to the value of the person in relation to one's own happiness." Close quote. Egoism does not condemn helping others, then. It does condemn self-sacrifice, placing a lesser value above a greater one. Notice that when assistance to others is rationally self-interested, it is not the recipient's need per se that warrants it. In Atlas, when Cheryl sees through Jim and comes to Dagny to apologize for things she had said to Dagny, she says, Cheryl says, that she doesn't want charity and that her suffering doesn't present a claim on Dagny. Now, Dagny is charitable with her in that encounter. And she's charitable not simply because Cheryl is needy and Dagny is running behind on the required quota of uh, charitable deeds. You know, she's, she's been very busy in this book. Right? Dagny explains in response to Cheryl's question about it. Dagny says, quote, I feel terribly sorry for you, Cheryl, and I'd like to help you. Not because you suffer, but because you haven't deserved to suffer. Close quote. The point is, a person's need may be the immediate occasion for assistance, but that aid will be rational only if the recipient has value to the agent, and giving the aid requires no sacrifice. Okay, let's turn to our second would-be virtue, generosity. A generous person gives in excess of what morality or custom requires. Unlike justice, generosity is not a matter of giving others their due. When I repay a debt, I'm not being generous. Similarly, when I fail to receive what another person would have been generous in giving me, no injustice has taken place. I have not been deprived of anything that I'm entitled to. While we primarily associate generosity with material values, evidenced in picking up the tab for dinner, for instance, or offering tickets to a friend without asking him to pay for them, people can be generous in other ways as well, such as with their time, their effort, their patience, praise, credit. One can be generous by creating an opportunity for another person, or in how one judges him. Whatever its specific form, the distinctive mark of generosity is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, readiness or liberality in giving. Essentially, generosity consists in giving more than the recipient has reason or right to expect or demand. Indeed, this is how Ayn Rand characterizes generosity in a letter, as a, quote, gift or favor greater than the friend involved could, in reason, expect, close quote. From the Greeks to the present day, generosity has been widely applauded. The term has become an honorific. To describe a person as generous is to praise him. Can generosity make sense for a rational egoist? And is it a virtue? Now on this one, I want to thank Leonard Peikoff for extended conversation about this particular 
would be virtue, generosity. Uh, he was quite generous uh, with his time. No, he, he really was. And I can detail, if you're interested, I'll detail that. He really was quite generous in his time. Uh, and I benefited a great deal from the conversation. Generosity is dominantly conceived to reflect altruism. Adam Smith, who as many of you know, was an influential moralist as well as economist. Adam Smith held that, quote, we never are generous except when we sacrifice some great and important interest of our own, close quote. Other philosophers have said similar things and contemporary ethicists follow suit. In some cases, explicitly positing that self-interest disqualifies an action from being generous and that the generous person must be willing to place others above himself. Now, such a conception of generosity is clearly anathema to objectivism. We could never endorse generosity as an instrument of altruism. The standard by which to assess the propriety of any generous deed is the same as that for evaluating all actions, rational self-interest. By that standard, however, it can frequently be appropriate to be generous. If a person can afford to give a friend more than the friend could reasonably expect, for example, and by so doing, contrib contribute to the well-being of something that enhances his, the giver's, well-being, rationality would approve. As long as a generous action is consistent with, ra with rationality and with all of the virtues, and as long as it is consistent with a person's hierarchy of values, such that it is not a sacrifice, generosity can be perfectly appropriate. To be a little more concrete, suppose a woman can, lend, can afford to lend college tuition to a worthy nephew who she esteems a great deal. Doing so can offer value to her. To the extent that she values her nephew, she wishes for his well-being whether she enjoys conversation with him, shared interests or hobbies, or simply the knowledge that this good guy is out there in the world, she benefits from the flourishing of this person whom she cares about. If she's in a position to non-sacrificially contribute to his success, it makes eminent sense for her to offer that. Consider another case, a voice teacher working to prepare his most talented, most promising, most devoted student for an important recital. We can easily imagine the teacher being generous with his time, staying beyond the scheduled sessions to work with the student, without that being a sacrifice. If he greatly values the student's development and his giving the best possible performance, and if he can spare the resources on a given afternoon to go over time, it can be in his interest to give the student more attention than the student could reasonably demand or expect. Turn up the stakes a little bit. Suppose that this is the most promising student the teacher has ever had, and he has the greatest hope for this student's potential than he has had for any in over 40 years of vocal instruction. Moreover, he finds working with this student immensely rewarding. In a case such as this, when the teacher can non-sacrificially spare the time and effort, he should be generous. His own values call for it. Generosity in such a case would be an exercise of integrity. Writing in a slightly different context, Ayn Rand makes this idea plain. And this is passage C on your handout. Quote, The virtue involved in helping those one loves is not selflessness or sacrifice, but integrity. Integrity is loyalty to one's convictions and values. It is the policy of acting in accordance with one's values of expressing, upholding, and translating them into practical reality." Close quote. When a person is in a position to be generous with someone whose success he values more than he values other possible uses of the relevant resources, to fail to be generous would be hypocrisy. It would betray one's values and abandon the rational pursuit of one's own well-being. Now bear in mind that generosity must be consistent with a person's hierarchy of values. The sheer fact that I value another person a great deal does not mean that I must make sacrifices for him. Sacrifices are not what's in question, though. When a sacrifice would not be involved, however, and when a person who truly values another person's success at some pursuit can afford to give assistance, integrity demands that he do so. 
On what grounds should he withhold what he can offer? On what grounds would it be rational if he truly values that person in the way that I've described? How would doing so better serve his interest? Now, at the same time, generosity is not always appropriate. The condition that generosity be non-sacrificial is critical. One should never give to others, even others whom one sincerely values, at one's own expense. A person can be too generous by bestowing gifts on people who are unworthy. For instance, individuals who are not appreciative, or who squander gifts, or who have track records indicating serious vices. Giving to such people is wrong precisely because it surrenders higher values to lesser ones. When generosity is appropriate, it is so because of the giver's values. Also note that the propriety of generosity turns not simply on the extent of a person's resources, but on the relative value of, the re of his resources and of the person he contemplates assisting. Even a person who has very little can, in some circumstances, rationally be generous with what he has. My larger contention, then, is that generosity is neither a virtue nor a vice. While we should not sing unqualified praise for generosity, neither should we reject it as always wrong. Whether it is good to extend generosity in a given case depends entirely on what one is giving, to whom one is giving, and why one is giving. Essentially, Generosity is appropriate when it reflects the rational pursuit of self-interested values. Now, so far, I hope, so simple. Oh. But to solidify our understanding, I want to take up a couple of possible objections. Some people would ask, doesn't generosity consist of offering a, a gift without seeking something in return? If Ayn Rand sanctions generosity only when the giver gets something out of it, she's converting generosity into a trade. But how could a trade be generous? That seems too calculated for true generosity. The objection is right that Ayn Rand endorses generosity only when it represents a trade. This is problematic, however, only if one assumes that generosity must be sacrificial. Offering a value to a person in exchange for another value is precluded from being generous on the presumption that generosity must result in a net loss. Yet that assumption finds no basis in our ordinary concept of generosity. Again, from the OED, readiness or liberality in giving. A person could give others more than they have reason to expect while still gaining value from doing so. The insistence that he cannot is arbitrary. Bear in mind that the return can take many forms, intellectual, emotional, the pleasure of a person's company, the deepening of a relationship. Alex might generously treat Roger to an expensive ticket to a football game because he would enjoy watching the game with the committed, knowledgeable fan that uh, Roger is. An exchange needn't be material to be genuine. Not that there's anything wrong with material returns, right? <laughs> They're always appreciated. The possible returns are as varied as the vast range of things that are objectively valuable in people's lives. What objectivism insists, however, is that a person committed to his well-being should treat his values as values and thus not be cavalier in disposing of them. It would make no sense for an egoist to spend his values without thinking that he will gain something from doing so. To surrender the very things that sustain him without expectation of equal or greater value in return would be treason to his happiness. As Dr. Peikoff observes in OPAR, in the objectivist ethics, virtue, quote, consists in creating values, not in giving them away, close quote. Okay, now a second objection. Another objection might arise from my claim that generosity can be misdirected to certain people. If there is such a thing as being too generous, if a recipient's being unworthy can render generosity toward that person inappropriate, then generosity may sound like a form of justice, and the gifts involved 
the kind of thing that a person can deserve or not deserve. Yet I stressed at the beginning of talking about generosity that generosity concerns giving something other than what a person deserves. So which is it? In the brochure description of the lecture, I raise this issue in slightly different form. I raise the question, if generosity is giving someone more than he deserves, is it at odds with justice? Well, notice, today I have not characterized generosity as giving a person more than he deserves. I've come to think that that is too crude an account, that that's not really accurate. Rather, I've said that generosity consists in giving a person more than he has reason or right to expect or demand. When the virtue of justice condemns treating a person better than he deserves, it's condemning treating him better than is appropriate. When contemplating generosity, however, desert is not the salient consideration. Justice concerns desert. Generosity, permissible generosity, arises when, within the bounds of justice, while respecting individuals' deserts, one considers doing more for a person than can normally be expected, uh, giving something extra. This does not entail treating a person better than is appropriate, as certain forms of injustice do. I think a simple distinction is helpful here. A recipient should be worthy of generosity, but that is not the same thing as deserving it. Being worthy is akin to being eligible, being a qualified candidate to receive certain treatment. It is not the equivalent of having a claim to that treatment. When a, I, I know this part is a little bit intricate, okay? So it, it'll end soon, but bear with us a little bit more. When a person deserves, right, talking in the language of justice again, when a person deserves a reward or punishment, he can reasonably expect it, for it is the rational response to his conduct or character. When a person is the recipient of another person's generosity, that is not so. Rather, he has had good fortune. When you are generous, in effect, you are making a person lucky. I recently read that way of putting it, and I thought that was kind of nice. Okay. The victim of injustice, the person who is not treated as he deserves, has a valid complaint. He might have run a reputable business, for instance, or achieved a solid character, and thereby earned certain opportunities. By not being evaluated objectively or treated accordingly, however, he is deprived of some of the values he has earned. Those who treat him unjustly deny him rewards that he did have reason to expect. The victim of others' lack of generosity, by, con by contrast, did not have reason to expect to be treated differently. So in sum, while generosity should be a response to something, namely the value that the generous person finds in the recipient, it is not a response to desert, and generosity is not at odds with justice. Now, before leaving generosity, I'd like to briefly consider the positive aura that generosity enjoys. Generosity often seems laudable because it suggests a, a spirit of benevolence, or a sense of life's bounty, or a non-competitive attitude toward others. A common impulse when a person enjoys some significant success is to share the wealth, whether literally or figuratively. Reardon, flush from the first pouring of Reardon metal, agrees to give Philip a large check for the Friends of Global Progress. Such benevolent attitudes can be completely consistent with rational egoism. A generous act does not always reflect benign premises, however. A person might act generously to impress another person or to alleviate altruistic guilt. While generosity often springs from emotions that are well-founded, because of the large role that emotions can play in prompting generosity, we need to be especially on guard not to allow emotionalism to govern our exercise of generosity. Reason must always stand at the decision-making helm. A final question here. If generosity is not a virtue, why does the ungenerous person 
the person who's stingy with his values, extremely reluctant ever to part with more than is absolutely necessary to satisfy the demands of justice. Why does such a person strike us as deficient? I think because such a posture suggests a failure to appreciate the true value of things. This person may, be, may view money, for instance, as an intrinsic good to be hoarded rather than as a means of enhancing his life. He apparently fails to realize that in sharing his values under certain conditions, he can enrich his life. Occasions on which a person should have been generous, but failed to be, typically reflect a mistaken judgment about the value of things, and correlatively about how best to serve his own happiness. When it is properly exercised, generosity manifests a healthy understanding of what the relative value of one's various, of what of one's various possessions, material and spiritual, is. Of what, the, I don't know if I said that properly, of what the, the relative value of these things is. Okay. That's what the ungenerous person seems to lack. Whatever genuine defects the ungenerous person may suffer from, however, they do not warrant the conclusion that generosity is a virtue. For rational egoist, generous action is sometimes appropriate and sometimes not. The propriety of generosity turns on its service to a person's overall rational interest. More specifically, it's governed by the virtue of integrity. If a person values certain things, he must act like it, treating them in a way that reflects their position in his hierarchy of values. This applies to values that are optional, such as one's love of music or of a particular person, no less than to fundamental values. A rational egoist sometimes should be generous. Okay, on to kindness. Our third subject is, in the words of Ellsworth Tui, the first commandment, kindness. What are we talking about? Examples. It can be kind to do a favor for a person, offering him a ride to the airport, feeding his pets while he's away, running an errand to save him time. It can be kind to remember a person's birthday with cards or calls, to send a get well note when someone is sick, to inquire about how a person is coping with a loss, not only when it first occurs, but sometimes af sometime afterward and after the customary period for polite inquiries has passed. Sometimes words of understanding are kind. Other times kindness is reflected in what a person does not say, as when he is tactful in presenting a delicate topic or when he's discreet in sharing certain information with others, even absent any explicit pledges of confidentiality. Simply listening, being there for a friend, can be kind, as can extending a warm welcome to a new neighbor or worker, acting to put a person at ease, acting to make the lone non-family member at a holiday gathering feel less the outsider, for instance. It's kind of a host, to anticipate his weekend guest's preferences and get in the coffee or cream that he likes. That's my favorite, as a coffee <laughs> crank. If you get one thing out of this lecture, if you ever have me over. <laughs> um, no comment on the coffee at breakfast. Anyway. A person can be kind in incidental interactions with strangers, such as by offering to let a person go ahead of him in the checkout line or holding a door for a person who's juggling packages, even though that person's still several yards away, or offering your cell phone to someone who's having trouble with the landlines in an airport, or something like that. If, by the way, if you're curious about the relationship between some of these examples or kindness and courtesy, you might want to raise that in the Q&A. I don't have a lot to say there, but I can say something. Now, the common element distinguishing all of these as cases of kindness, is one person's considerateness for another. The kind person is sensitive, he's thoughtful about what another person's experience is like, and he acts to enhance that experience. The Oxford English Dictionary defines kind as, quote, having a gentle, sympathetic, or benevolent nature, ready to assist or show consideration for others, close quote. Kindness, it reports, is a feeling of tenderness or fondness, affection, love. 
Now, I would suggest a slight modification, or at least a certain emphasis here. The kind person is not merely ready to assist. He does. Sitting around feeling empathy is too passive. A kind person does something about it. Kindness involves action. The action could be extremely modest. It might consist in saying a few encouraging words. Yet the person whose sympathetic feelings do not issue in correlative action is not truly kind. He fails to deliver the very thing that makes kindness valuable. Thus, I will take kindness to mean acting out of consideration for another person's well-being, being considerate of another person by acting to assist or cheer him. While assisting and cheering can assume many forms, this seems to capture the essential elements uniting all cases of kindness. When a person is kind to another, he acts out of consideration for what it is like to be the other person, to help him or to brighten his experience in some way, however modest. The scale of the gesture is not as important as the fact that a gesture is made out of concern for the other person's well-being. Now, something I want to point to on the handout, but I'm not going to read, um, is this. Because the same action will sometimes be kind and generous, or kind and charitable, you could begin to get confused about the differences between these three concepts. So on the handout, I've put a few notes to clarify that. It's under the heading, Notes on Relations Among the Three. Okay? So I'll ask you to not read that now, but I just pointed to you so you know it's there if you want to look at it later on. Okay? Now our chief question again is, what is the moral status of kindness? We see numerous instances of kindness from Ayn Rand's heroes. Dagny is kind to Cheryl, having her call her Dagny, for instance, inviting her to stay the night that night out of concern for Cheryl's emotional well-being. Dagny is kind to Jess Allen, the bum she allows to stay on the train and buys dinner for even before she learns all that he knows about what had gone on at the factory, right? Reardon is kind to Mr. Ward, the earnest businessman uh, for whom he goes to some trouble, this is fairly late in the book, I think, he goes to some trouble for him to sell him 500 tons of steel. Rourke, in the fountainhead, Rourke is kind to Keating and to Winant at various points. This should not surprise us. By the standard of rational self-interest, kindness offers positive value of at least three distinct types. First, kindness is a means of furthering one's values. To the extent that a person cares about the people to whom he is kind, he is helping those individuals by making their path, if ever so slightly, smoother. Actions need not be extravagant in order to bring real benefits to their recipient. Any saving of time, any effort of inclusion, any soothing word is typically greeted as a definite gain for the recipient. We all know how heartening it is to be on the receiving end of kindness whether a door is held, a welcome is extended, or one simply feels nurtured by another person's solicitousness. Kindness cushions the coarser edges of a day. Much of what kindness offers is the knowledge that another person cares. It is not only the card on the mantle or the minutes saved by a friend's favor, but the concern that the kind act expresses that is valuable. In fact, the emotional impact of kindness can be strikingly disproportionate to the substance of the act, as even minute gestures can exert a buoyant effect on a person's spirit. The point is, receiving kindness can genuinely benefit a person, often more for its spiritual boost than for any material assistance. Thus, if one values, if one person values another, kindness is a way of nurturing that value. Second, but much more briefly. Second, kindness can strengthen the relationship between two people. Now I say can, not that it necessarily always will. But by indicating the sincerity and something of the degree of one person's regard for the other, acts of kindness can lead to increased understanding of each person's attitudes, which might encourage a greater investment on each person's part and foster a gradual strengthening of their bonds over time. The third benefit of kindness lies in its contribution to a warmer social climate. To some extent, kindness breeds kindness. 
as many people are more inclined to be considerate of others, the more they find others being considerate of them. The more frequently other drivers allow a person to fold into a lane of traffic, for instance, the more inclined he may be uh, to do the same for others. Now, in an era of road rage, I will venture no hard and fast claims about the reasoning of motorists. I'm not claiming necessary connections in this third value, but the experience of others' kindness often does have the effect of putting people in a more hospitable mode. Thus, if a person finds a kinder environment congenial, his own kindness can help to bring that about. When a person is kind, he makes the world more to his liking and may subtly incline others to be more disposed to kindness as well. The larger lesson is that kindness can offer definite value to an egoist and therefore will often be appropriate. Its chief value is the first that I mentioned. Kindness is a means of tending the values one finds in specific other people. Nonetheless, kindness is not a virtue for the simple reason that kindness is not always appropriate. Like charity and generosity, kindness must never involve self-sacrifice. Whether kindness is appropriate depends on the prospective recipient's value to the agent. Other people do not exert a freestanding claim on a person's energy that he is duty-bound to respect through acts of kindness. Certain individuals are not worthy of kindness. No kindness is owed to the cheater or ingrate or malicious manipulator, let alone to Timothy McVeigh or Osama bin Laden. Such people are unworthy because kindness to them would be self-destructive. It would be perverse for anyone committed to his own flourishing to reward such individuals with kindness. Individuals who do not merit feelings of tenderness, fondness, affection, or love, as the OED had put it, should not be treated as if they did. In denying that kindness is a virtue, Ayn Rand is hardly sanctioning the abuse of other people. Respect for rights and justice demand that a person always respect others' freedom and treat them as they deserve. Moreover, while one alternative to kindness is being unkind, another is simply being neither particularly kind nor unkind. Ayn Rand observes in her journals that a person's basic attitude toward his fellow men should be a, quote, benevolent neutrality, close quote. I've alluded to the fact that being the recipient of kindness tends to feel good. Why is that? Not to get too saccharine about it, but even observing an act of kindness, when you are not the beneficiary, I think even that can be heartwarming. Think of little incidents of kindness that you might observe in a given day. Um, a waiter's good-natured good -natured patience with an elderly pat patron who clearly it takes some patience in dealing with, right? Or a young man's cheerfully giving up a seat on a bus to a clearly weary older woman. I mean, if those things just make you feel nice, why is that? What's going on there? What are we responding to? Gestures of kindness, holding a door a few moments more than minimal courtesy would require, pausing to inquire whether a solitary walker on a country road needs assistance, that kind of thing does happen in Texas. Uh, these gestures signal respect for the value of a person's life. A person does not have to seek his self-esteem from such encounters to welcome them. When a stranger extends kindness, precisely because he doesn't know you, the distinct values that you bring to the world, his action is a way of saying, we, human beings, are special. Whatever else is going on, it is individual human beings who are the greatest values in the world, who create values. Therefore, I will exert this small effort on your behalf. Receiving kindness, then, is either an affirmation of one's own individual value, if the person knows you, and that's why he's being kind, or it's an affirmation of human life as such. Since objectivists value our lives and value human life, we are mildly cheered by acts of kindness. Now, in a related vein, I'd like to raise a question, pose a question. Would you like to be kind? Granting that the alternative isn't necessarily being positively unkind, okay, saying, no, that's not the only alternative. 
Still, would you prefer to be a kind person to one lacking that quality, a non-kind non person? I mean, think about that. I won't give you enough time if you really want to think about it, but pose that question to yourself. And because I'm the speaker, I'll tell you my answer. I would. I'd like to be kind. Now, I don't mean I want to be the old lady who, who you know, takes in the greatest number of stray cats on the block or something like that. That is not what I have in mind, and that's not just because of an issue with cats or anything. Uh, but I would like to be kind where appropriate. And I don't think that's a quirk or a mistake. So I'll be interested in what you have to say about this in Q&A, because I've, I've, I've been a little unsettled in my thinking about this. I've gone back and forth somewhat. But here is my thinking. Indiscriminate kindness, bestowing kindness on all comers regardless of their value to you, that would be a mistake insofar as it squanders your values and sabotages your own well-being. To cultivate kindness toward persons whom you value, however, is a means of advancing your values. If rationality is the cardinal virtue, and if rationality consists in governing one's thoughts and actions by reality, then sensitivity to the experience of people you value would seem to be called for. Being considerate of another person means tuning in to the actual particulars of his context. This seems a requirement of objectivity. If one values another person, then such considerateness and corollary action seem the logical way of valuing him. When a person is insensitive, not considerate of the experience of those people he values, he fails to realize opportunities to promote his values. When, alternatively, a person is sufficiently sensitive to recognize salient features of a valued person's situation, but then does not do anything to help or cheer him, assuming that all the relevant conditions have been met and it wouldn't be a sacrifice, he fails to live by his professed values. So as with generosity, integrity, I think, sometimes demands kindness. Now that may seem too strong. That may seem to make too much of kindness, to eliminate the discretion that seems crucial to what kindness is and to why we appreciate it. Right? I mean, when someone is kind, you think, oh, that was so nice of him. He didn't have to do that. Right? Now if I say it might be required by integrity, I'm bringing in a, he has to. Okay. But again, bear in mind, I'm not proposing that all permissible acts of kindness are required by integrity. And I'm not saying if you value human beings, then every time you can do something nice for someone, you should. That would be sacrificial. You've got your own life to live, your own values to pursue. What I'm proposing is, as I put it, sometimes integrity demands kindness. Some acts of kindness remain optional. Note that an action could be compatible with a person's values without being required by them. Attending a particular concert isn't required by my love of music. Attending this conference isn't morally mandated for all objectivists, and the rest of them, they're out, right? Off the lists. No. Uh, similarly, many acts of kindness will be compatible with a person's values without being required by them. Nonetheless, in certain circumstances, a person's values, and thus his integrity, will require that he take certain types of action that are kind. I've got a little more to say on this, but in the interest of time, I won't say it, but if you want to ask about it in Q&A, uh, I can say a little more that might be helpful on this. Now notice, even here, I am not elevating kindness to the ranks of the virtues or reversing my earlier claim that all three, KGC, are comparatively minor issues. I'm simply observing that kindness toward appropriate persons is a way of valuing what you value and as such should be encouraged. Part of why it isn't a big deal, a big issue, is that a healthy egoist won't have to mount an arduous campaign battling fierce resistance against uh, being kind. Kindness toward many people will come rather naturally. And many ways of being kind are extremely inexpensive. They don't take a lot out of you. Nonetheless, while the scale of kind, needs can, kind deeds can be, can be quite modest, 
It is not the size of an action's stakes that determines its propriety. Rational self-interest does. And by that standard, kindness is not a virtue because it is not in all cases in one's interest. Extended towards certain individuals, being kind would work against the agent's happiness. A rational egoist should be kind selectively and non-sacrificially. That completes our direct consideration of these three purported virtues. In the time remaining, I'd like to explore the relationship between KGC and altruism. One could probably devote an entire lecture to this, but even scratching the surface, which is all, all we'll be able to do, even that, I think, is instructive. I said at the start that while KGC are not objectively significant moral issues, they assume great significance in our altruistic culture. Why is that? Because altruism inclines people against KGC. At the same time it implores us to be ever more KGC, the doctrine of self-sacrifice poisons people's inclinations to be KGC. Consider, when your guiding philosophy is altruism, what view of other people does that engender? A, people are needy. So needy that we can build an entire moral code around it, serving others, right? That's what altruism preaches. See to others' needs. B, people's needs must take priority over one's own interests. Where one person has a need, I have a duty to do all I can to alleviate that need. Their well-being takes precedence. This sets up antagonism between individuals' interests. When sacrifice is commanded as a person's absolute duty, the well-being of others comes at the expense of one's own. My vacation should be given up to buy rice for the hungry in Sudan. Forget about vacations. Everything I do for my interest, every video I rent, every evening that I stop and get a ready-to-eat meal instead of, you know, to spare myself the chore of cooking, all of that comes out of the hide of other people's needs that I am leaving unfulfilled. This breeds resentment as eloquently described by Jess Allen in Atlas in his account of life at the Starnes factory. Other people are walking IOUs, each a breath away from announcing his needs, which translate under altruism into losses for you. Who would be kind under such a script? Who would be generous? Who would be charitable? Indeed, who could be? There is no charity when every ounce of blood you can offer belongs to others by duty, so long as they have some need. Generosity? Please. If so much of my energy must go to others by their altruistic claim on it, simply for me to fulfill my duty, anything I have left over I'll keep for myself, thank you very much, at least until some new need presses its claim against me. There will be little in the pot with which to be generous, and any scrap of self-regard that altruism has not yet entirely extinguished in a person will naturally exert itself in resistance to generosity. What might have been generously given to certain other individuals in a rational morality will tend to be guarded for dear life under altruism. Kindness? Do slaves feel kindness toward their enslavers? It would be difficult to be warmly disposed to other people when obligation already requires you to give them, to give to them, and to give all you can at your expense, sacrificially. Now, most people, even most professed altruists, don't do that, of course. They make some sacrifices, the more bearable ones, but they lead their lives in contradictory steps, a minuet of pro-self and anti-self measures. Yet all this does is stir up further resentment toward others, a further animosity, since their others' needs, that endless stream of demands on one's life, pose an ongoing reminder of one's own failings, prompts to feel guilt for not doing more. In other words, to the extent that one is a good altruist and makes sacrifices whenever he encounters others' needs, he spends all the values that he might have kindly extended toward others as a matter of obligation to fulfill his duty. And to the extent that he doesn't do that, but accepts altruism's claim that he should, he will know his moral failure. Other people are everyday reminders of that. Be kind to such people? 
get out of my face. <laughs> Altruism renders other people a burden, materially and spiritually. It is no wonder that kindness and generosity and charity have to be drilled as virtues. They'd never make it without the stick that beats all of a sacrificial morality into people. The irony, in other words, is that it's those who preach KGC, these apparently most benevolent of virtues, who don't value human life. KGC are unnatural to an altruist. That is why they must be emphasized as virtues. It is no accident that appeals for KGC are typically pitched at the emotional level. Have a heart. Basic human decency, feeling, calls for this. How could you not contribute? Has the blood in your veins frozen? Right? Logical arguments could not sustain regarding KGC as virtues, as standing obligations to, I'm sorry, as, yeah, as virtues, as standing obligations to sacrifice. Emotional appeals are their best hope. Now, in rejecting altruism and in rejecting KGC as virtues, it should go without say, though in our culture it can't, that Ayn Rand is not rejecting fellow feeling, sympathy, empathy, or heart. She is rejecting morality by emotion. She is rejecting the intrinsic value of human beings. She is rejecting the notion that the value of human beings is interchangeable or equal. The rationality that she identifies as the primary path to human life is not an alternative to feelings and is not at odds with placing real value on other persons. The suggestion that it is, is insulting. From the time I began thinking about working on these concepts, deciding which purported virtues I would even address in the book, I experienced a strong aversion to addressing kindness in particular. How do you argue for kindness, I wondered. I mean, it seems so basic so natural to want to be kind, and so easy, so little to do. It seemed demeaning to even think about corralling reasons to be kind. What savages would not see its propriety, at least, again, in certain circumstances? Well, the answer I've come to realize is altruistic savages. No, I'm very, very serious. If you value human life, Kindness seems the natural accompanying disposition. But altruists don't value human life. So riveted by need and weakness and suffering and their own spiritual depravity and failing to live up to their code's demands more consistently, they haven't a clue. Consequently, they need all the prodding and coaxing to be kind or generous or charitable they can get. Accordingly, altruism treats all three as major virtues that a person must labor strenuously to practice. KGC are among the sacrifices that altruism demands. Objectivism, by contrast, treats these three as, in appropriate circumstances, logical ways of burnishing one's values, sometimes manifestations of integrity, but a natural outgrowth of a genuine commitment to one's values and no big deal. The suggestion that egoists have no heart or can't be KGC reflects an utter lack of understanding of the value of human lives. It is insulting not only to egoists, but to human beings. The value of human life is to most people an empty phrase. They do not understand the value of a human being. They do not understand values at all. The heroes of Ayn Rand's novels are not distinguished by the need for kindness, generosity, or charity. This is precisely why they're worthy recipients, as Dagny explains to Cheryl. Need is not the currency of rational egoism. Values are. And Recognizing the tremendous value that countless human beings have offered us, anonymous as well as celebrated, as well as maligned, and recognizing the potential value of every person we encounter, 
The idea that rational egoists could not be charitable or generous or kind is really beneath contempt. I cannot tell you how galling I find it. It's one of those things, frankly, that when I start to think about it, I, I cannot articulate. I have never articulated to myself what it is that gets me about it or how it gets me. And if I start really think, feeling about it now, you know, I would just have to end there. But it, no, it, 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 I find it tremendously galling. I will say this. We have admired the winged victory. We have admired Michelangelo's David. We have known Kira Arganova and Howard Rourke and Hank Reardon and Francisco Danconia and Dagny Taggart and John Galt. These people and their creators give the human race a good name, to put it mildly. Not everyone has it in them to be Dagny Taggart or John Galt, true. But everyone has it in them to be Eddie Willers. Everyone has it in them to be the wet nurse who turns around. And that is why a rational egoist will be eager to be kind, generous, or charitable, and to hope that when a person does have some need, or when assistance could help or cheer another person, the circumstances warrant giving it. Objectivists value human life. It is because we do that we can be rationally, egoistically kind, generous, and charitable. A few final words. Altruists corrupt all human relationships by distorting them into a sacrificial framework where the proper may, must be a loss. Because KGC are typically packaged with altruism, it can be tempting for an objectivist to reject them altogether. That would be a mistake, surrendering genuine values to the altruist. The challenge is to practice kindness, generosity, and charity without being sucked into the self-sacrificial ideals, ideas of their propriety and demands. KGC are not ends in themselves. They are not unqualified goods. They are not standing duties that we should always be ready to practice toward all comers. But nor must they be sacrificial sops, concessions to an alien moral code. They are, as I've said, no big deal. But they are a little deal that can enhance our experience. On appropriate occasions, when consistent with rationality and all the virtues and with a person's rational self-interest, being charitable or generous or kind are ways of integrating thought with action, of valuing your values in practice. So when appropriate, we should be charitable or generous or kind. Our lives will be the richer, and I think we will be the happier for it. It can help to keep the light bright in this sunlit universe. Thank you. Questions, and I imagine questioners should come up to a mic for the taping and all. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you'd have any observations. I found there's a lot of confusion and clutter with these because of the way they're abused in most of our experience. Mm -hmm. Either as window dressing for vices. I think of Al Capone's famous quote that he found that he could get much further with a kind word and a gun than with a kind word alone. <laughs> and also as psychological weapons. Um, maybe we've all at one point had a relative who liked to make people the subject of their petty altruisms. You know, for example, at dinner, if you have ground glass in your hamburger, they would say, oh, I'll eat that one, take mine. Uh, but 
th- th- I f- just found that, that those kind of psychological things have, have really corrupted these for people. I, I don't think I have much to say. Um, I'm sorry. I think you're right that they're off, you know, I mean, the larger understanding of them is so soaked in altruism that I think that's what even allows them to then be used as psychological weapons because, I mean, often they're used with guilt attached that I'm, you know, holier than thou, I'm kinder than thou, or more charitable than thou, or more giving than thou, or that kind of thing. You do in Atlas see... um, Hank's mother, for instance, referring to kindness. You know, tr- I mean, obviously they're trying to make him feel guilty, and thank God, increasingly he doesn't over the course of the book, right? But um, you can find some passages where Hank's mother is clearly using kindness. I mean, she's really contrasting kindness with justice and talking about how there's no virtue in treating a person as he deserves. You know, real kindness is doing something else. And Jim Taggart has lines to that effect as well. So that's. That's not, I don't know, exactly the kind of thing you were talking about, but it's something that comes to mind just in terms of how these are used. But again, I suspect that part of why they're even able to be used as weapons is because of the extent to which people accept them in an altruistic way and accept altruism and therefore think, well, yeah, I guess I do have some obligation here. And it's part of why I think it's important to really think them through, you know, for an objectivist to think them through and think, well, you know, because there is a lot going for them, but there's a lot that's wrong with them and we don't want to buy into that garbage. And if you don't sort it out in your mind, you can find yourself sometimes not without having meant to buying into the altruistic version of these things and doing things on some misguided premises. Okay. Yeah, when, when you were discussing uh, the, when it was appropriate to be kind or generous or charitable, you talked a lot about the, the value of the other person and the, the potential of the other person, this kind of thing. I wonder, though, if there's, if there's another aspect to it, um, mainly in the case of generosity, uh, not just the value of the other person, but the value that the, that the person attaches to uh, the activity that is involved in being generous. I think, uh, for example, I'm always amazed by you can go on the internet and you have a computer problem. There's chat rooms where people who don't even know who you are are willing to just answer all kinds of questions just because they really enjoy the activity of solving the problem. And uh, I, I also think of uh, Rourke helping out Keating, um, mm. you know, who probably wasn't doing it just for for Keating's potential, but because he really enjoyed the challenge. No, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think I wouldn't want to... I guess my worry about focusing exclusively on the activity is you want to be careful who the beneficiaries of an activity that you might enjoy are. Am I helping hackers out there? Am I helping these idiots who start viruses or whatever, right? I mean, so, so I wouldn't want to isolate only the activity because you, you need to be, uh, you know, to be rationally self-interested from a big picture point of view, you need to be careful about who the beneficiaries of what you're doing are. Also, if one, I, I'm not, I'd have to think this through more clearly, but if you're doing something solely for your enjoyment of doing it, then I'm, I mean, generosity seems like it is partially, at least partially, primarily probably motivated by, yeah, well, I want to help this person at this time. Now, it might be a little bit sparked by, I've just had this great success, I'm in a good mood, I'm in that share the wealth kind of mood. This is, you know, one of my good friends, let me take him out to dinner too to join the festivities tonight, right? Um, But I think, you know, with generosity, there is a real concern for benefiting the other, and you need to be careful about who it is you're benefiting and all of that. But, I mean, you raise an interesting issue that some forms of generosity can also involve activity. Activity, right? The way in which what you're generous with is something you really enjoy. Even in the, one of the examples I gave, the vocal instructor, right? He, I said, when you turn up the stakes, I made the case such that he really finds it rewarding to work with this guy. But that again is exactly why, I mean, in that kind of case, his integrity would demand that he do this on the given occasion when it's not sacrificial and so on. But I'll have to think about that some more. You raise an interesting aspect. Thanks. Okay. Uh... I have a question about your definition of generosity. Can you hear me? This? Yes. Okay. Um, if in generosity, one party gets more than he expects, then 
Well, for example, if uh, it's like a, a, a business transaction where things are equal, then in this definition of generosity, then it's kind of like me coming to you and saying, hey, I have an idea about how we can both benefit mutually a little bit more than we previously thought. Um, I don't see how, with this definition of generosity, how uh, it is different from, in a business transaction, from somebody coming and saying, hey, I've got, I've got an idea about how we can benefit more okay. than we expected originally. All right. But I think in, a, in that kind of business scenario, look, you're trying to do business with people who you think it will be beneficial to do business with. And you're trying to do people with the best such people out there, that is, people who will, bring, who will be bringing more and more value to the table, so, so to speak. So, you know, I mean, I want to be trading with the best people. I want to be teaching the best students I can teach. If I'm a businessman, I want to be, yeah, I want partners who will give equal for equal, but I want to expand my business. So, I, of course, I'm looking for, and I'll be dealing with this guy because I think he has the potential to have some really good, original, creative ideas that allow us both to gain more. So, I mean, that, I guess I'm not quite clear on the problem there. Mm. Well, in, in an act of generosity, it is something that... Okay, here we go. I'll put it in a more poignant way. Um, I don't see how uh, generosity maintains its integrity if there is an equality of benefits. How, I'm sorry, how it maintains its integrity if there's an equality yeah, of how, benefits? How doesn't, how doesn't generosity break down once there is an equality of benefit? Well, okay. Generosity, I said, is giving a person more than he has reason or right to expect or demand, right? But there is a gift going on. I mean, you are giving a person something, and that seems different from the, hey, I've got an idea for a business transaction in which we can both gain more than we had previously. But that's not a gift. That's a proposal for a business deal we can make, right? Whereas when I give you the tuition, whether it's something as grand as a year's college tuition or something much less, the free ticket, Right? Or when I give you the three extra hours, three extra hours, right? it's a gift. Now again, in my account of it, you should be getting something of at least equal value out of it, even if it's a different form of value, right? So you should be getting something out of it, but it is nonetheless a gift, right? And, and as recipients of generosity, we're thankful in a way different from we're really glad that my business collaborator came up with that really good idea. I mean, we're not... I mean, any thankfulness there is of a different caliber, I think. Okay. There are a few other people behind okay. you, so I think I should go on. And then if there's, maybe, maybe if there's more time. I'm sorry? Maybe we can talk. Sure. And, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you indicated that you could say some more about your discussion with Dr. Peacock on generosity. Oh. Well, I just want to uh, thank you. Um, because, well, thank you. Um, he was very generous. And here's, here's what I mean. This was about a year and a half ago. So, I mean, this past year he was in Austin a lot because Amy Peikoff was there teaching, and so he was there a lot, so that was wonderful. But even before that, before I got to know Dr. Peikoff, you know, even better in this past year, about a year and a half ago I emailed him a question. He had said at an earlier point that I should feel free to do that sometimes, and he said, you know, and then we can maybe set up a time to have a chat by phone. So, but just tell me what it is you want to talk about. So I emailed him a question about generosity and a few other issues. And I got a call, and he said, well, you know, uh, but wouldn't it be better if you just came out to California and we talked for a weekend? <laughs> oh, gee, let me think about this. Um, no, but I mean, I, you know, and he's like, yeah, no, and this way you could stay a couple of days, so then when you have follow-up questions, you know, sometimes you have, you know, that would be really, I think that was a goddamn bloody generous offer. <laughs> and he gave me a lot of time, I, and I mean, he really gave me, I mean, Okay, enough said, I think, but really nice, really nice. And great material, I mean, great material on a, all of my, I mean, all of my, he was like, so if there's more, you know, let it all out. So it was really good, it's really good. It's nice to be. One of the things that I enjoy about 
being with objectivists is um, kindness in a different sense, mm. and it's the relief from altruism. It's when we go out to eat and we split the bill accurately. Hmm. Or, <laughs> or if, um, and I think of the, the scene with Midas Mulligan in the valley where he has the car and he's lending it. He's not lending it, hmm. he's charging, I forget how much a was it, tw or 25 cents. And it's because they all want to get away from give and need and that sense of that altruistic goo. And so I find that many times, I am so overappreciative of somebody who is accurate with me rather than kind in the way that I've come become accustomed. Right. Maybe it's because I've been saturated with altruism uh -huh. that that's uh -huh. the case. Yeah. And the second example is think twice. The kindness uses as a weapon that sense of generosity or kindness that's lethal. Mm -hmm. So just those two No, points. yeah, no, those are, think twice. Thanks for reminding me of that. I should look back at that. Um, yeah, I, and again, you know, you mentioned gift, but again, often gifts are wonderful and they're great and they don't have to be self-sacrificial, but they're so often given in that way or, right, and it is refreshing to not have to deal with that. Yeah, it's funny, that passage in um, Atlas where, who is it who lends the car? Is it Mulligan? Midas Mulligan, Midas Mulligan, Mulligan right, who lends John the car. And, you know, Dagny is a little taken aback. It's like, he can't just give it to you, he's charging you a quart, right? And I think uh, Galt says something like, we don't use the word give, or something like that. Now, I think if you take that out of context, you would think, oh well, she's against generosity, or something, right? But I, I think she's really putting it that way there to emphasize, the, I mean, to, to try to express the whole mode of social interaction in the valley, and to contrast that starkly with the altruistic code that, that rules in the world, right? And you also, I mean, just if anybody is inclined to, I think, take that the wrong way, that passage, you do want to bear in mind um, that point that I think it was Robert Mayhew who brought this out in one of his essays in his recent collection, that Ayn Rand said something in a letter to someone about how you can't read a novel as if even the good guys in the novel are speaking with philosophical precision or writing philosophical treatises on things. So you wouldn't want to take that business about give in the wrong way there. But yeah, thankful. And by the way, let me also get in. I have been, I haven't even been here 24 hours, and I have been the beneficiary already of at least three very distinct acts of generosity and or kindness from fellow objectivists. So thank you very much. And it's nice to have had that wonderful experience already. Um, I've got a question about being the recipient of kindness, generosity, and charity. Is it ever wrong to accept it, or is it ever not okay to accept it? I think that's a really good, interesting question. And I, I don't have a full answer to that. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, one thing I can say is this. In her essay on the question of scholarships, Ayn Rand talks about this kind of thing somewhat. Now, she's talking there mostly about uh, accepting, for instance, federal aid or accepting from you know, the government when one doesn't approve of what the government's doing. And what she emphasizes there is, you know, you need to be opposed to the welfare state, for instance, and to maintain your opposition and to keep voting against, you know, I mean, if you ever had a choice of somebody who was against it, right, you know, to vote appropriately and so on. But, so I mean, one, uh, you know, she further says there, you needn't sacrifice yourself to such a system or help those who have already stolen your money to take more of it or not let you be, a, you know, the somewhat beneficiary of it and so on, right? So I think in that, along those lines, one wants to keep in mind that one should never be doing something from a short-range perspective that will in the long run be enhancing the very policies, you know, be they government policies or even, I would think, private individual policies that are anti-life, long-range. Um, but I, I don't know what else to say about that for now. I mean, you do want to be careful who you're, uh, you know, I mean, there are people I wouldn't take gifts from, right, because of those people's principles and those people's actions and who those people are. And I mean, I think that makes sense because you don't want to in any way be sanctioning evil or, well, you don't want to be sanctioning or supporting evil. Okay. You mentioned you'd come across recently an interesting example of compassion in philosophy. <sighs> Yeah. I was wondering if you have time. To okay, sure. That. A few weeks ago, I picked up a book on terrorism, 
because I'm thinking that I might want to propose teaching a class at the university uh, about the ethics of war sometime. So I, so I started, you know, so I picked this up, not thinking this would have anything to do with kindness, but silly me. Um, one of, the, and I read just a few of the pieces so far in this book. It's a collection by different authors, but a prominent philosopher, philosophers will recognize Martha Nussbaum, our friend Martha Nussbaum. She's a great Greek scholar, and uh, anyway, Robert Mayhew was choking back there. Um, <laughs> Very, the, very prominent, very widely published. I think now she's at the University of Chicago. She's taught at Brown, you know, all the prestige that the field has to offer. Her essay was entitled Terrorism and Compassion, or vice versa, okay? And what is she saying in there? Well, what philosophical lessons should we learn from September 11th? We need more compassion. That's the lesson. Because, you know, most suffering in this world is not caused by acts of terrorism. It's caused by malnutrition and lack of education and poverty. So in order to get people to do more about those things, not just to feel badly when you see something on the news and then get back to your own life, right? In order to get, you know, to train people to be more compassionate and more giving in their compassion, what we need to do is educate kids about all the suffering in the world. This has to become a, quote, very profound, which I object to just even, if you say profound, you don't need very, okay? <laughs> but leave that out of it. But that quote, right, I mean, this needs to become a very profound part of children's education across the years. And she, you know, she gets more specific than that about they need to learn not just about dramatic episodes of suffering, but about the daily suffering of the children in, I forget the town, was something like Rathsanjan, India, and how difficult it is for them to get a good diet and how difficult it is for them to shirt heap and so on. But this is the lesson, the philosophical lesson about compassion that we need to learn from 911. Now, again, it's that kind of stuff that just makes you want to, you know, well, you know, it makes you want to reject compassion along, but anyway, so th it's amazing how alive some of these ideas really are. Yeah, wherever you are. Oh, okay, we're out of time. Sorry, thanks.